All right, and then um, one last question. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, some of the accompanying work that you did, which was in Columbia, correct? Yeah. With indigenous and campus, you know, camp communities. Yeah, um, so I was working there as an international human rights accompanier, and basically it's a strategy um, that's been used in conflict areas all over the world where um, outsiders will, um, usually foreigners, um, will come into a, a space where um, human rights activists or environmental activists are being threatened, physically threatened with death threats um, from a lot of times uh, paramilitary uh, groups um, from the military itself, um, from a number of different um, threats um, for, for the work that they're doing. So basically it's a strategy where you have a foreigner come in and the idea is that a foreigner is gonna be less likely to be targeted. So if you're physically in the same space as an activist, um, their likelihood of being attacked uh, reduces. So um, I was... Is it different Is it different than being a human rights observer? Um, Which is a term I've heard. Maybe. Yeah, it's, it's similar to human rights observing. Um, I think that accompaniment is sort of, um, it's a little bit more active. So you're, you're um, I think with, with observing, um, you're sort of just like creating kind of a log and then reporting back to others about what you're seeing. Um, there might be limitations of like who you're accompanying or how. Um, <clears throat> it's very, it's very similar. Um, basically our work involved, um, physically accompanying, um, folks in, in areas that had been, um, disputed over between the FARC and the Colombian military. The mm. FARC being the oldest uh, left-wing guerrilla group in, in the Western hemisphere. Um, and uh, yeah, you're, you're basically, um, so there's this kind of physical component where you're accompanying people, but then there's also kind of similar to human rights observation, there's uh, an advocacy uh, component of it as well. So meeting with folks in embassies or meeting with um, you know, other NGOs, um, with the Colombian military, with the Colombian government, um, to talk about what you're observing. Um, uh, and it, it was, imp it's also important to note that it wasn't, um, accompaniers are not the voices of the people that they're accompanying. They're not expressing their desires. They're also not telling, um, the folks that they're accompanying what to do um, or what their best strategy uh, for defending themselves should be. It's really just about um, using your own kind of identity as a foreigner as, to the benefit of uh, whoever wants to use it, however they want to use it. Um, so I think that was something that was really appealing to me in international accompaniment work is that it's a lot of any kind of human rights work um, or international development work of any kind usually has this very kind of colonialist tilt to it where you have like the people from the global north who come down and they fix the problems of the people from the global south um and this was kind of the opposite it was sort of about being in solidarity with people and kind of uplifting their own their movements um uh and kind of using your status as a foreigner to call attention to whatever they wanted you to call attention to so um so yeah, as I mentioned, I was working with campesino communities um, in uh, the northwest of Colombia that were in territory that the the FARC uh, had recently relinquished to the to the Colombian government, um, and then also accompanying um, you know indigenous communities, um, other other communities around the country, um, some of whom were uh, on lands that private companies were trying to take over. Um, or that had, uh, private companies had already taken over and had completely de destroyed the local environment. So communities were trying to advocate for um, some kind of retribution. Um, so just kind of saw um, kind of the on the ground impacts that a lot of like private sector interests have on local communities um, in that right. work. Yeah. You know, it's, we were talking earlier about uh, Brazil being one of the most dangerous places for environmental activists, Brazilian environmental activists and indigenous communities and land defenders. Colombia also ranks at the top of that list as well. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering like what sort of like what levels of violence did you see or hear about kind of working in that area from whether it's from like right-wing paramilitaries for the government or some of these some of these companies which I'm sure were friendly to uh, certain advocates yeah I mean I, I could talk about that for hours um right. but um yeah in um I, I think what became really clear to me in that work was that the um, so I came into Colombia right the month after the peace accords had been signed between the FARC and the Colombian government. Um, like 20, 2015, 2016? Right? 2016. They were signed yeah. in November of 2016. Um, and I got there in January of 2017. Um, and um, it, it was kind of this time where Colombia really wanted to, the government really wanted to wash its hands and say, look, we figured it out. We're at peace. Everything's great. We can, we can have as much international investment um, as possible now. They really wanted to open themselves up to, um, uh, yeah, uh, international investment. Um, and so they were relaxing a lot of regulations, um, environmental regulations. They were sort of, um, it became clear that there were links between the, the military was not protecting, at least the, in the communities that I saw, the military was not protecting the rights of, of the people that lived there. It was really um, protecting the interests of the government to open up a lot of those areas for multinational companies to come in. So, um, yeah, I mean, and there's there was also this whole kind of added element of the the FARC, which had been really the only authority for for a lot of um, for a lot of people living in that part of the country for the last fifty years. They'd never seen people from the Colombian military or the state or the police, and so suddenly they had um, you know the military coming in um, or paramilitary forces coming in and trying to take over um, the I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself, but the, the FARC had done a lot of narco trafficking work mm -hmm. in some of those areas. And so they left and they created a power vacuum. Um, and uh, suddenly there were a lot of paramilitary groups that were coming in and trying to take over those drug trafficking routes. But mm -hmm. there were also links between paramilitary forces and the actual Colombian military. Um, a lot of folks were seeing, you know, that the military was not going after paramilitary forces. Um, and that's because, uh, at least according to a lot of the communities that I was accompanying, because there was an interest on the part of the military um, to open up those areas for, um, for international um, exploitation. Um, so, yeah, in a nutshell, <laughs> um, yeah, the, and the, the kinds of interactions that I had with um, uh, with with paramilitaries was that yeah we we would come across them um, uh, in in accompanying groups uh, through the jungle um, and um, ha would have to ask them to leave um, um, territories that we were um, that that folks were trying to to live on peacefully um, we were working with a community that um, refuses to do. Um, uh, th that refuses to participate in any kind of um, armed struggle. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't um, fight for the FARC. They wouldn't fight for paramilitary groups. They wouldn't engage with the Colombian military. They don't allow armed uh, arms on their territory um, and they don't grow illicit crops. They have a set of guidelines. Um, and so we were accompanying them. Um, and um, there were a few times where we, we came face to face with paramilitary uh, soldiers and would have to ask them to leave. Um, so, and then there were also times where we could hear um, uh, battles going on between, uh, bombs going off between paramilitary um, and Colombian military, um, which people were very skeptical about whether or not that, that was actual combat or if it was kind of being performed um, to appear as though there was um, antagonism between those forces. Anyway, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely a really eye-opening experience um, for me to just kind of see uh, the, the interest in profit uh, goes right down, right down to the to the little people. Yeah, I think it's I think it's also important that now you're working in 
rainforest environmental advocacy here in the U.S. with that, I haven't been through that experience. Yeah, I think there's definitely a, a through line there for me. Um, yeah, and it, I also think like the that experience was a really unique one and most people, you know, have never heard of that, uh, that context or that situation. Um, and so it's, it's really um, challenging to draw those connections for people between, you know, a wonky company like BlackRock and, you know, people being displaced from their, their farm in the middle of the Colombian jungle, you know, or the Amazon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is a little off target, but, you know, the other day, interestingly enough, Steve Horn was from Kenosha and you're from Rochester. And could you just like talk a little bit? I mean, does, are you surprised by what's happening in Rochester? What's the kind of general relationship there between the police and, and, the, and the city, you know, uh, administration and, and uh, non-way communities? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I mean, I should I should say like I haven't lived in Rochester for ten years, <laughs> um, but I, I was there recently last last year. I did live there for a little bit, um, but I I can say Rochester is probably one of the most segregated cities, um, you know, in the country. Upstate New York is a particularly racist, segregated um, part of the country, um, and Rochester is absolutely no exception. I I've told friends this before, but um, I did kind of a community uh, organizing fellowship um, through the University of Rochester uh, several years ago and uh, was working in um, a part of the city um, that has a lot of issues with, with drug trafficking um, and violence. And um, it was just really fascinating to see the relationship between the police um, and, and folks uh, in the community. Um, because the, the kind of the level of like overt racism is, it's, it's like, it, it's kind of unbelievable. Um, there was, just to give, give some examples, um, in this particular community, there was, a, uh, you know, there were some guys that would sell uh, weed on the corner um, or maybe it was, I don't know, some kind of drugs on the corner and the, pol the local police would regularly arrest um, black and brown guys that were selling um, on that corner. And the uh, white kids from the suburbs would drive to that corner and pick up their supply for the week. Um, and the Rochester police had developed a policy where they would just scan the license plate number of the car um, and then run it through a database and figure out which address it was associated with. It was always associated with, with some house in the suburbs and they would just send a polite letter to the parents um, of that uh, of that uh, vehicle, just letting them know, hey, just so you know, your vehicle was spotted in this area. There's high uh, drug trafficking rate, so maybe you should talk. If you have any children, you should talk to them about drug trafficking. But the double standard was kind of incredible. And um, another experience I had uh, during that fellowship actually was a police ride along that I did with a, a police officer um, in Rochester, um, and I remember her saying. Uh, explicitly to me that they did racially profile people um, because quote unquote black people just commit more crimes. So the kind of ignorance and uh, bigotry that runs rampant in the Rochester police force is like no secret. Um, and uh, I think another thing that um, is probably typical of a lot of police forces around the country is that most of the police officers that work in the Rochester police force don't actually live in Rochester. They live in the suburbs. Um, and a lot of them are uh, really scared white people. Um, so yeah, it's, it was unfortunately not um, surprising at all to hear that that kind of um, violence and bigotry is happening in Rochester. Um, and I think people are totally uh, outraged um, and they should be. Um, and it's really upsetting that, that, the, that the mayor knew about it and didn't do anything about it until she was confronted with public pressure. <laughs> Kenosha, Rochester, we're, uh, pretty soon we're gonna need uh, mediators uh, in, uh, in America, you know? <laughs> yeah, accompaniment. I mean, yeah, international accompaniment. accompaniment. Yeah. Yeah. For for. for I don't know US. where we would source them from, but yeah, yeah. Well, I don't. I don't think they. You know, 
unlike uh, much of the world, I don't think these right wing militias in the U.S. would give a damn. So you know, it's uh, true. It's true. And what you're seeing now, and you know, something I've seen a little bit of uh, investigative journalism on when you when you talked about Colombia, I thought of it. Um, you know, it's no, it should be a secret that police are involved in you know all kinds of black market activities. And I think, you know, that, that, that stuff's going on as well, too. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a connection with a lot of these right-wing groups uh, as well. You know, I, I've seen reports that, you know, when COVID hit, the police, you know, there are police who are involved in illegal human trafficking, illegal drug trafficking, things like that, uh, which probably picked up considerably, you know, so. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, um, that's not just, you know, unique to the rest of the world. It happens, it happens to here, too. Yeah, I, th I think that the fact that that's becoming more and more apparent, just, it's, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you guys have, have spoken about this more on your on your podcast, but I just feel like we're, we're slipping um, much more evidently into, into fascism um, in the US and like, um, it's just becoming all of these, these relationships existed before and I think they're just being made more explicit to people. Yeah, I mean, I study foreign policy and international relations. So the police here just remind me of a paramilitary, you know, extrajudicial, extrajudicial killings and this kind of these relationships with these far right extremist groups, you know, uh, kind of extra legal groups. So um, I've been thinking about that a lot, you know, especially actually with regard to Colombia and, and Brazil is one of the worst in the world, too. And El Salvador and most of Central America in the 80s was like that. So you're seeing that here in American streets now. So uh, yeah, it's it's pretty 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 grave. So thanks so much for everything. It was I learned so much. Like I said, I don't know as much about this as I wish I did, and I know a lot more now. So I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks. Obviously appreciate the work you're doing too. So it's, it's been great. It's been great talking to you. Yeah. Same. Likewise. Thanks so much.